this. What do we do in the midst of a world that's changing, and how is it that we respond the way that God would have us to respond? So if you want to take out your notes with me this morning, and maybe you've already done that, you can follow along. If you're here visiting us, and you're here for Stuff the Bus, I hope you feel so comfortable and welcomed here. Um, We just want to be able to bless you this morning, but this morning I want to just challenge you with uh, about things that change in our world. Uh, There's one truth that will remain the same day in and day out, and that is simply this. Everything changes, right? You know, you wake up in the morning, and it's a whole new day. You cannot address today with yesterday's thought processes or patterns. You can't, you can't navigate through the future based on, well, this worked on Thursday, so therefore I'm going to treat every day the same way. It doesn't work that way. Uh, if, if, it w- if it would work that way, we, we, we could kind of harness that and figure things out, but everything always changes. So we've got to figure out what God has to say to us about change in the midst of a, a world that is constantly, constantly changing. You know, I love that movie, um, Jurassic Park. I used to watch that all the time. I saw half the second one. I've never seen the third one, but I hear that the last one, The Lost World, really is just awesome. So I'm going to have to check it out. But when I was talking about a world that always changes, I thought about this scene. And um, you know what? The world has a way of kind of chewing you up and spitting you out, right? Uh, You can experience chaos. Situations can be difficult. It can be nauseating. And somehow, if we don't learn to navigate through change, we're just going to get crushed by it. You've heard me say this before, but you can either ride the wave of change or you can be crushed beneath that wave. Uh, You've heard me say before, too, that change isn't change until you do what? (laughs) Until you change. Until you actually do something about it. You can talk about it. You can can tell other people they need to change. By the way, change is simply this. It's taking, it's taking responsibility for that which God speaks to you and doing something with it. That, that's what's going to help you navigate through change. Because sometimes we define change like this. Um, change, yeah, God, I want you to change my life. I want you to change my circumstances. I want you to change my finances. And here's the way I want you to do it. And we tell God how to do it. Or we want everyone else to change around us so we can be comfortable for where we're at. But have you found that that doesn't work? It just just doesn't work in our world. So how can we navigate through change? Well, this this morning we're going to talk about that from the book of Ecclesiastes from a man named Solomon who was one of the wisest men in the Bible, Uh, one of the richest too. And he had it all. He had fame. He had fortune. He had all the, the, you know, the Rolls Royce mules and the Cadillac donkeys, you know. And and, I mean, he had all the stuff that was popular. Uh, He was rich. He had all the ladies, he had all the food, he had everything, but yet he said there was an emptiness. There was a void inside of his life, and nothing filled that except a relationship with Jesus. And he learned that when when you have all the stuff of the world and all that the world has to offer, it's going to change. And if you don't know how to navigate through those changes, you're going to find yourself lost in this, this sea of change, not knowing what to do. Some of you here today maybe have gone through change of a job, and you're navigating through those seasons of change. Some of you maybe have experienced the loss of a loved one, and and that's hard to walk through. And you're going through a season of loss and grieving. But I want you to know God is with you, navigating you through those changes. Just because those things have happened doesn't mean that God has stopped being God. He's going to lead you through those seasons. Some of you are here today for Stuff the Bus. And by the way, if you're here visiting and you've never been here before, just look for somebody with a yellow shirt and ask them, hey, if, if you've got a question, where's the restrooms or how can I help or you want to know something about the church, ask them. Somebody walked in today and they said, it looks like a Crayola box exploded and all the yellow crayons were left over or something with all the shirts. But I want to tell you this, as, as you're going back to school, some of, some of you, um, it's a new grade. You're going from 6th to 7th or 7th to 8th. For some of you, it's a, it's a whole new school. You're starting in a new building and it's, It's kind of scary, but it's just a season that you're in. And I want to tell you this too, the season that you're in, you you may be fearful in the midst of it right now, but there's going to be times where you're going to look back on these seasons of life, and these are going to be some of the fondest memories that you have. You know, uh, time goes fast, doesn't it? Have you noticed that? People say time seems to go extremely fast, except on Sunday mornings. (laughs) And uh, 
there's a, just something about time and how fast it goes. It seems like just the other day, my kids were five, six, seven years old. Now they're 15, 16, 17 years old. Where did that decade go? And it just went so fast. And I remember, it seems like high school was just a few years ago for me. And, and it was more than just a few years ago. But I can think back upon some of those seasons and remember some, maybe some of us think back on the junior high days and say, those were the greatest times. Some of us may think of high school and say, those were some of the greatest seasons of life. Or, or maybe for some of us, it's when you, you newly got married and you're saying, that was some of the greatest seasons. You're going to have those, those memories. And there's always going to be seasons in life. And here's the truth about those as well. They are going to change. One of the things that frustrates me the most, let me see if it frustrates you, is I can't believe that the world would change and not ask my permission about it. How about you? You ever have things change on you and you're like, well, who changed that? Yeah, who said that they could change that? Nobody checked with me. Nobody got my approval. Nobody asked me how I felt or what I thought. And life just seems to change. And you can sit there and bellyache about it all day long, but if it's changed, it's changed. And we've got to learn to adjust to that. There, there's going to be seasons where we've got to learn how to navigate through those. How many of you are uh, fans of the Olympics? Okay. I've been watching them on TV and some of the, some of the favorites. I like, the, I like the, di the diving and the swimming. I like the gymnastics a lot. I cannot believe you can do that with a human body. These little people, you know, and all of a sudden they just flip around like just some kind of a... a a blender or something, you know, legs everywhere and flying in the air, and, and somehow they, they stick it in the end, and they're able to land. And they didn't just get there overnight, did they? No, they went through a season of training. As a matter of fact, they've been practicing probably, uh, I'm going to use the four-year window since last year's Olympics, but I'm sure they've been training before that as well, all for that moment. And just so they can perform, as a matter of fact, I saw on the news the other night, uh, one, one of the Frenchmen, was it, that did some kind of a, I forget what it was, a vaulting or something like that, and snapped his leg. Can you imagine training for an event for most of your life only to arrive to that season and snap your leg? How frustrating would that be? Yet in the midst of life, if you don't learn to adapt to things of change in your life that way, all you're going to see is the negative. All you're going to see is the bitter. All you're going to see is what, what, what was taken from you, and all you're going to see is your losses. But in those same seasons, there's also gains that you have. There's also new things that God's going to do. There's also a fresh new word that he's going to deposit within your heart. But if you're not looking for it, guess what? You won't find it. Seasons are always changing. Let me just kind of as a, just getting to know you kind of a thing. How many of you here are winter people? That's your season. I like winter. I like snow. I like ice and all that other stuff. Okay, you guys need to leave the church right now because <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Winter, okay. Spring. How many spring people? Just a few. Okay, summer. All right, how about fall? Yeah, fall seems to win every, both, both, both services. So, yeah, it's, everyone has their favorite season. And if I were to ask you why you love your season, winter people, you would have a reason. And if I talk to you or you or you that raised your hand, you may have different reasons for that season. But still, it's your reason. I like it because I can go out in the snow and sled. I like it because I can, I can like go do donuts in the parking lot at the church. Not that you would ever do that, but um, I, I like winter because it's Christmas and I get gifts. I like it, the winter, and some of you are going to say spring because it's fresh and new and temperatures are, temperatures are changing and fall people are going to like it because the leaves and the coolness of the air, not too hot, not too cold. Then there's those crazy people like my wife and I who love summer. We want to cook until we can't cook any longer. You know, I, I told, shared with you a few weeks ago, I was on the heat too long, got some heat stroke. That didn't bother me a bit. I didn't feel good, but I love the heat that much. I was back out in the sun the next week. Seasons change. We all have reasons for the seasons that we like, but they're going to change, and we have to learn to adapt to them. One of the races they have in the Olympics is the 4x400 uh, four relay. And the 4x400 four relay is a race with four people, obviously, that run and pass the baton from one person to the next they get to the end of the race. Now, these runners really don't have a problem starting the race. They don't have a problem finishing the race. They don't even have a problem uh, running through that race. You know where the problems come? It's in the passing of the baton. It's in the transition from one runner to the next runner. If something is going to go wrong, odds are, percentages are high that it will go wrong in the midst of the handing of the baton from one person to the next. It's going to be in the midst of that transition. 
And it's the same in our lives. When you're going through one season, maybe you're in a season right now where you're saying, this is the best time of my life. I'm enjoying this, this season of my life, and, and, and I love it. Maybe you're enjoying that. Maybe you're in a season where you're saying, I'm not liking it so much, and I'm not wanting to do this. I don't want to be a part of this season. Seasons are going to change, and when they do go from one season to the next, problems are going to arise, not in the season you're in, but it's in the moving from one season to another. And so I just want to give you four things real quick that can help, help us navigate. We're going to read Ecclesiastes. I'm going to give you four things that will help us navigate through these seasons of life as we change, because change is always around us. Uh, we're going to look in Ecclesiastes and read that in just a moment, but let me share this with you. Did you know that today, 50 to 70 billion of your cells are going to die today on your body? Did you know that? You're like, well, that's a comforting thought, Pastor. Thank you very much. Yeah. The good thing is, is you have new life that's regenerating all the time. Change is happening. On average, most people today are going to lose somewhere between 150 to 200 strands of hair. Some of you. <laughs> Some of you can't afford it. <laughs> we don't think about those things, but life happens. On average, that, that kind of happens. Hair kind of falls out, whether you scratch your hair or it's a brush or you're washing your hair. You don't think about that, but change is always happening. Change is constantly going to be taking place. Change is going to be inevitable. And so the, the, the toughest moments we find is not the seasons that we're in as much as it is moving from one season to another. Let me read to you from Ecclesiastes. Solomon has something to say about this. He says, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under, the, uh, under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance. And then it goes to verse 11 and says, God has made everything beautiful, beautiful for its own time. In other words, God is in control. What Solomon is reminding us is, is that God has laid out the progression of seasons for each and every one of us. And there's a season for everything. Some people will tell me, they say, how do you justify this whole a season to die when you go over in the other hand and it says, thou shalt not kill? Well, there's seasons for everything. You see, when you're in the midst of a battle and there's a war that's going on, it's a time to kill. There, there's a reason for the war. But just because you don't get what you want doesn't mean you can pull out a gun and shoot somebody, right? That's not the right season. There's boundaries that we have, and we've got to know what each season has for us. There's a time to grieve. We've got to know that when we hit seasons in life where we're going through grieving, it's okay to grieve. Just don't make that your place of residency, okay? There's a time for it, but there's going to be another season that's coming. Maybe you're not uh, experiencing much joy in your life. You're going through a, a sorrowful time. It's a season. Don't stay there. Let it be something that God is bringing you to because God has made everything beautiful for its own time. So here's some principles I want to give you to help you and I through these seasons, through these storms that we face, because we will face storms, but I want to guarantee that if God said, we're at point A, and I'm going to take you to point B, you can guarantee that God is going to get you there. Well, what if I hit some storms along the way? Then God will get you through the storms, because God is a God of the storms, as well as everything else. So let me give you three or four just things that can help us and navigate changes in life, Okay. Number one, write this down. Change should be managed, but not manipulated. Change should be managed, but not manipulated. God is going to bless us, and when he does, sometimes his blessings, when it comes in the form of change, we don't, we don't like it. We don't know what to do about it. We don't know how to navigate through that. So instead of managing the change that God brings into our life, we manipulate it so everyone else has to change and we can remain the same. But the reality is, is maybe, just maybe, God's going to accomplish more by bringing this change into our lives, but if we resist it and fight it, then we're never going to experience the blessing that God has for us. God loves us so much that he allows change to happen because he doesn't want us to always stay the same. He wants us to be able to change. How many of you would like to remain the same forever? Anybody? Think about that. Because if your parents here, you're saying, I want my kids remaining, you know, three years old forever. I don't want to be changing diapers forever. You want there to be growth. You want there to be a maturing process that takes place. 
You know, these seasons you go through, sometimes they may be painful. Sometimes they may be difficult. But it may just be God wanting to see growth in our progression in our life. Let's read what Ecclesiastes 7, 13, and 14 say. It should be up on the screen. Let's read this together. You ready? Go. Accept the way God does things. For who can straighten what he has made crooked? Enjoy prosperity while you can. But when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. You know what happens a lot of times? We have to remind ourselves of this. Because when things are going good, sometimes we forget to even give God thank, tell him thank you for the good things that are going on. But if we're going to do it, it's usually going to be in the good times, not in the bad times. Oh, God, thank you for the house. Thank you for the car. Thank you for the blessings. But when bad things are going on over here, what happens? Many times we start shaking our fist at God. And we start saying, why are you doing this to me? And it's not that God's doing anything to you. You're going through different seasons of life, and God is the God of both of or all of those seasons that you face. And he says, don't try to manipulate things. Just let them be managed well. He's trusting us in the midst of these seasons to seek him and what he has for our lives. See, what Solomon is saying in those two verses is that through those moments of change, that instead of crying out to God just and always saying, why God? And we have those moments, don't we? We say, why God? I don't understand. Why am I going through this? Why do I have to face this? Why are we doing this? What we need to start asking as well as that is, God, what are you going to do? What change do I need to see take place? What is it that I need to be hanging on to? You see, God loves us so much that he wants to take us to new heights. We can choose to be obedient to God's plan, or we can, we can be distant from God and what he has for us. The choice is always going to be ours. We could be like a, like, like a fine-tuned engine with God, or we could be like in perfect harmony uh, with him, like as in an orchestra, let's say, as a musical instrument is. Or we can be that instrument that's out of tune. And the problem about being an instrument that's out of tune is, is everyone notices them, right? <laughs> you, don't, you don't think you're that noticeable, but have you ever gone to the concert, let's say, and you got that one person that's squeaking out the clarinet or the flute? And, you know, it's not as noticeable to them as it is to you because when they hit that high note, everyone goes, <laughs> and they do one of those. And they're doing great. They're trying really hard, but it's very noticeable, isn't it? See, when we're out of rhythm with God, when we don't let God be God in our lives, all of a sudden we get out of tune with what it is that God wants to do in, in our lives. We're usually the last ones to see it, too. See, Solomon was probably saying here that, he's saying that, listen, I've experienced life. I, I, I've gone through it all. I, I've tried to manipulate things. I've tried, I've tried to make things work for me and change everyone else. And, and, and I've, I've thought of everything, and it does not work. What works is coming to God and letting God be God. What works is not manipulating things, but managing well what God gives. In Proverbs, it tells us a, a simple verse. Let's read this one together. Ready? Go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. It says make, that we are to trust the Lord with not just a portion of our heart but with all of our heart. And when you do that, he's going to reveal to you what it is he's sharing with you. You know, I, what I really struggle with personally is, is he says, lean not on your own understanding. Do you know how many times, I'll use myself as an example, I find myself leaning on my own understanding more than I'm leaning on God? Do you know what he means by this? It is, uh, I used this illustration um, um, before, but there comes a tipping point. There comes a point when he's saying, lean on him instead of your own understanding. And when we say lean, we usually think of this, right? This pulpit I'm leaning on. If this pulpit disappears, it's okay because I got my own back. I can take care of it. But when he says lean on him, what he means is, I want you to lean so far into me that if the pulpit disappears, you're going to hit the ground. He says, I want you leaning on me so much that you have to completely and totally rely upon me so that when things come to fruition and you start to receive blessings, you'll say, had nothing to do with me, had everything to do with God. He says, lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him that he is God in your life, and he is going to take all those areas that seem confusing, mangled, and crooked, and he will straighten them out. 
See, he just wants to be able to know, who are you going to give the glory to? And it comes when we start looking at the seasons of change and not manipulating them, but managing them well. Number two, write this one down. He says, don't make permanent decisions based on temporary conditions. When, when change, when seasons of change and life changes, do not make permanent decisions based on temporary situation, conditions. It's kind of like, the best one I can think of is at the dentist. I don't like cavities in my teeth, you know? Nobody does. But I also don't like the dentist drilling in my teeth. So let's say I got a cavity in my tooth and I say to the dentist, hey, just pull all my teeth out. That way I'll never have to worry about cavities again. Can I do that? Well, absolutely, I can do that. But it's not the wisest choice to make because you need your teeth, right? Well, we could just go ahead and get fall. And we always got a way to work something out, don't we? We always got a way to make things happen and, and to recreate that which God has already created. To, to be our own provider for that which God has already provided. But the truth is, is if I were to have them remove all my teeth because I'm afraid of one cavity, I'm making a permanent decision based on a temporary cavity that's in my mouth. Just get the cavity fixed. Just address the temporary thing that's going on and let God be God. So often we make permanent judgments based on temporary feelings. Like when somebody tells you, oh, you always do it that way. You ever have somebody say that to you? Kind of in a negative way or they'll say, Oh, you'll never change. Let me tell you something. If you've been saying that to somebody or somebody's been saying that to you, you probably never are because you keep feeding that negativity into your life. See, we tend to get, when we speak words like that, we tend to get shoved into a corner. And we should never express a negative absolute in a passing situation because then we're manipulating temporary situations into absolutes that will cause us to kind of paint ourselves back into a corner. You know what I mean? We start speaking negatively, and we start, we start saying, you're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to get that done right. You'll never, you'll never understand. You'll never figure it out. We tend to paint this negative picture, wondering why life always feels negative. We've got to start making sure that we don't make permanent decisions just based upon how we feel as well, though. See, our reaction to God uh, is sometimes, you know what? I don't, I, I'll never allow change in my life. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if it's possible sometimes. But all the while, God, he wants to reveal to you and to me that when you're going through a season in life that has changed, all he wants to reveal to you is, is that God doesn't want you to stay in the place and stay the same. He doesn't want you to remain the same. He wants you to grow in the midst of the season you're in. Like I said, some of you here today, I know, I know some of you are going through the experience of loss. Some of you are going through experience of, of consequences because of wrong choices maybe that you made. Maybe you're going through some situations where it, you've done nothing wrong, but you've been wrongly accused. You know, it, it can be a, a number of things. Whatever season you're in, what God wants you to realize is don't make that your residency. It's a temporary thing because seasons change. Things in, in life will change, but he wants to change you in the midst of that season. So when you get to the next season, you're constantly learning and growing. Let me read Galatians 6, 9 to you. Actually, let's read this one together. Galatians 6, 9. It's up on the screen. You ready? Go. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. For at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Don't give up. When you're going through change in life, and you maybe are not happy about the change that's taking place, don't give up. Don't give up. You see, he says, at the right time, you will reap a harvest. When will you reap the harvest? At the right time. Well, when's the right time? Well, God knows when that right time is. And sometimes I found out that God doesn't tell you when the time is because if you know when the time is, you're going to screw up that right time. You're going to try to figure it all out and help him out. And God says, no, just listen, listen. Just don't get tired in doing what it is that you're doing and doing good and doing what you know is right. But at the right time, I'm not going to let you know when it is, but at the right time, because I know when that time is right, if you will keep on keeping on and not give up, there's going to be a blessing that's poured forth into your life. See, we're all seeking the blessing. We all want to receive a blessing uh, from God, but it comes in God's timing as we seek Him. But that means we can't make permanent decisions based on temporary events you're going through. 
See, sometimes we make these, these erroneous decisions when we're going through relationship challenges or maybe you've got a roommate that you're, you're living with and you're not getting along right now and all of a sudden, boom, things blow up. You, well, that's fine, I'm out of here, and you kind of leave. But you can't afford a, a, an apartment. You can't afford one on your own. Now everyone's on the street. Because, you know, we start making these decisions based on an argument. You have to work through those things. You just can't live with them. But change always comes in life. And God says, I will give you what it is that you need. But you got to seek me. And don't go making permanent decisions based on temporary feelings. Number three, write this one down. Focus on your faith, not your frustration. Focus on your faith, not on your frustrations. Anyone here ever get frustrated? Okay, five people again, and the rest of you are lying to me, huh? We all get frustrated, don't we? Uh, you get frustrated. Uh, we live in a society right now that caters to convenience, right? We don't like to admit it, but it's true, especially here in the United States of America. Get it to us the fastest and the quickest, and it better be good. And it better not be too much. And um, there's something to be said that when you go to a restaurant, whether it be fast food or sit down or whatever, you buy something. If you don't get what it is you paid for, if they forgot something, you do need to go back and take care of some of those things. But there comes those times when you go through uh, the proverbial drive through and get what you ordered, and, and if the bun's slightly messed up and we just freak out like they just stomped on it or something, you know, don't you know, I had to wait three minutes for this cheeseburger, and we start yelling about how we had to wait three minutes. You know, we're, we're, we're cater, we, we cater to convenience. And sometimes we're going to be so frustrated about everything. Why? Because we want what we want when we want it, right? We may not want to admit that, so I'll just say that for me and myself, okay? And, you you know, if you want to amen it, you feel free. But I know at times in life, I want what I want when I want it. And that was one of the hugest lessons I had to learn in my life. Because once I saw the ugly truth, then I had to do something about it. I just had to be, again, this is me. I know it's not you guys. This is just me. But when I looked in the mirror, I said, you're kind of selfish, Jim. You want everything, but you don't want to have to pay for it. You want everything handed to you. You want what you want when you want it. Now that you know that about yourself, what is it that God has for you, and what are you going to do to bring balance in the midst of that? Because life is now changing. You can sit here, and you can whine, and you can complain, or you can say, God, what is it that you have for me in this season of my life? You see, you have a choice to make. You can embrace frustration or you can embrace your faith, uh, which brings up a, a, an interesting question. If you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, you have nothing to grasp onto. It's there, but he's not going to make you follow him. He just invites you to come and follow him. When change happens in life, we have to make sure that we are embracing our faith, not our frustrations. Have you ever lost anything important to you? Couldn't find it? You got frustrated? You don't know where it's at? Somebody else lost it? Have you ever loaned something to somebody and they lost it or they broke it and never got it back to you? That can get frustrating, can it? See, there's a lot of things in life that can frustrate us and we just kind of, at times like that, lose this connection with our faith and we forget about it (laughs) and we kind of go off on people, you know, because we get frustrated. We get fed up. Did you know that it says that in the Word of God, The only way to develop our faith is through suffering. Did you know that? You guys are loving this sermon, aren't you? Like, thanks a lot, Pastor. I'm feeling really good. Did you know that the Bible says that the only way that you and I get to develop or increase our faith is when we go through suffering? Now, you may not want to sign up for that. If I said, uh, increase in faith class, you know, we're all going to go through suffering together. Sign up sheet back here in the back. Sign up. Nobody's going to sign up for that. Nobody wants to sign up for suffering, but the reality is this. We increase in our faith, trusting in God, when we go through sufferings. Why is that? Well, you don't have to have much faith when stuff's handed to you, do you? But when you have to work for it, when you have to struggle, when you lose sleep, when you have to seek the Lord, then all of a sudden you learn a lot more. I I kind of equate it to when I was going through school. Um, Maybe you're like me in this. I I had some teachers that I liked, and I had some teachers that I didn't like. How about you? Did you guys have those? Okay. Did you ever have that teacher that just drove? I mean, they were the hardest teacher in the world. I mean, they shouldn't be teaching. 
Somebody should yank their license away because they give us too much homework. He lectures all day long. He requires us to do our homework. He requires us to listen to him. I mean, what's he thinking, right? And, and he's just a difficult teacher. You know what I found to be true? The most difficult teachers I've had and the most difficult classes I've gone through are the ones that I've learned the most. I hate to admit it, but it's the truth. I'll be like, that teacher, you know, yeah, he just, they're just miserable, you know, they're just horrible, but they're pushing me to a place I don't want to go. But if he wasn't there pushing me, I never would have gone there either. But now because I've gone there, I've learned something I never would have learned. Therefore, in the midst of that change, as difficult and as frustrating as it was, my faith was able to increase. I started to learn some more. And just as, as we do in class, the same is true in life. When we go through difficult seasons in life, God is not there hating on us. He's not putting us through seasons because he says, listen, I'm going to give you a season of joy, and you, I'm going to give you a season of doubt. And you get a season of worry, and let's just, he's just sitting back watching to see what happens. That's not what he's doing. Life has a way of happening. And he says, in the midst of all of your seasons, God wants to reveal himself to you so that we can grow and become wiser and learn to function by faith, not just our frustrations. Are you with me so far? Okay, you doing all right? Okay. It says in the Bible this, in Psalms 33, 11. Let's read this one together. You ready? Go. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him, revere him, honor him, respect him, stand in awe of him, is what it's talking about. God says that, I want you to stand in awe of me because I am your savior. I'm your creator. And by the way, he also says, I know the answers to all the questions you have, and I give them to you, I'll reveal them to you. As you come into my presence. He says, I want you to respect him. You know, Solomon, um, through his writings, he, he tells us to fear God. Now, fear God, it, what he's saying is, is this. He's not saying, hey, I want you to fear God like Jason off of the Halloween movies or Freddy Krueger's or something like that. He's not saying fear me like some kind of a horror slash, you know, movie type of fear. But he's talking about understanding what respect means. How many of you here have ever been shocked by electricity? Yeah? Once it happens once, you kind of have a little bit of a, a respect for it, don't you? Yeah. You know what you're doing? You're fearing the electricity. It doesn't mean that you're in bed twitching going, oh my gosh, what, what, what if it hits me? You know, you're not afraid like that. Well, not most times. <laughs> Unless you get a good shock. <laughs> what it means is this. It means that once you've experienced, bam, the power that's there, you go, this is way greater than me. And it doesn't mean that you're afraid to turn light switches on and off now. It just means you now know there's a greater power behind that switch that you're flipping that's greater than you. And you have a respect for it. God's saying, listen, he's got all the power. And though you're going through life and you've got decisions you've got to make and even those seasons will change, he says, I want you to have a respect. When you get re frustrated, understand that God's got the power to get you through this. Just function by your faith. Don't worry about the rest. Trust him because God's love will endure forever. Solomon understood this. Solomon understood what it meant to fear the Lord. And he says, when you fear the Lord, by the way, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom. You want to become wise? Fear the Lord. You mean like scary? No, no, respect. Having respect for him and for his word. Most of us, when it comes to the end of the day or the week, we just want to rest, right? We want to we hang out. We want to relax. We want to release all the stress and, and enjoy ourselves and unwind. But God's goal for us is learning to become more like him. He, he goes on in Romans 8, 28. Let's read that one together. It should be up on the screen. Ready? Go. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He says simply this, it's okay to relax. It's okay to enjoy life. I want you to have fun, but I never want you to leave me out of it. God wants to be at the center of all it is that we do. He says, I have a purpose and a plan for you. So the underlying question that he asks is this, do we love God 
with all of our hearts. And all that we do, are we experiencing the love of God? If we do, then we can allow him to make changes in our lives, to grow in our faith. And that brings us to our last point. Number four, write this one down. When things are changing, be grateful rather than grumble. Be grateful rather than grumble. Such a practical point, but how many grumblers do you know in your life? Uh, we could all raise our hands, couldn't we? Uh, let me ask you another more dangerous question. How many times have you been the grumbler? <laughs> how many times have you been the one that, that'll never work, you know, why are they doing it that way? And you start complaining and you start being negative and you start pointing out everything that won't go well instead of being thankful for that which you have. You see, God says this. He says, why would I, now this is not me quoting the Bible, but I'm going to paraphrase, why would God trust you with more if with the little that you have, you can't even be grateful for that? If you can't even stop and say, thank you, Lord, for blessing my business. Lord, I acknowledge, I acknowledge that I am who I am simply because of you. Lord, I just want to thank you for, the, for, for all the things that you give me. Here, uh, on the count of three, everyone take a deep breath. One, two, three. How thankful are you for that breath you just took? When's the last time you've ever thanked God for that? You'd be like, oh, come on, pastor. I'm not going to walk around saying, thank you for that breath, Jesus. Oh, and thank you for that one, too. Oh, and thank you for that breath. No, don't do that. They're going to lock you up, okay? They're going to medicate you beyond belief. But when's the last time you just said, Lord, I just thank you for life? I can't tell you how many times I thought the world evolved around me. I'm acknowledging today, Lord, it evolves around you. See, that gets you out of your grumbling state, and it gets you to a place of gratefulness. Get you to a place where you start being thankful for the little that you have so that God can bless you with more. It goes on to say in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3, verses 12 through 13, it says, I know there is nothing better for men than to be happy, to do good uh, while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and, be, uh, and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. In other words, he's saying, I want you to enjoy life. I want you to be satisfied. I want you to enjoy everything that you have. Just don't leave me out of it. And don't forget that there's a purpose for your life. Let God work through that. God does want us to be happy, but he wants us to move from the point of frustration to a place of being grateful so that we can be happy in the peace of God and what he has in store for us. Let me end with Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be what? Thankful. And be thankful. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, as you leave here today, my prayer is that we can come to a place of realization, just how much God loves us and how much God wants to work in our hearts and in our lives. He suffered for us so we could experience his joy eternally. So we, we should be grateful for that. We need to get to a place that those seasons will change, that we not focus on manipulation but on managing, so that we get in a place not on being frustrated but operating in faith, getting to a place where we're not just complaining or grumbling, but we're grateful in all things for what Christ has done for us and given to us. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, I just thank you, Jesus, that as we come to the end of a message, Lord God, that it would be the beginning of a new journey. Because for some of us here today, we've kind of forgotten and we've left you out. And Lord, we just want to simply say, forgive us for that. Lord, we thank you for the very air that we breathe. We thank you for the car that we drive. We thank you for the food that we get to eat. We thank you for the health that we have. Lord, even if our health is failing or we have some issues, Lord, I just want to say thank you that, that, that we have people that can help us through those seasons of life. So, Lord, we just choose to be grateful today and ask that, Father God, you would accomplish your word and your will through our lives. Maybe you're here today, and I've said, move from frustration to faith, but you, you don't have that faith. I just want to simply give you this opportunity. We do it every week because I don't want anyone to not have the opportunity to make a decision to follow after Christ. If you're here today and you've not made a decision and you're saying, I really would like to, I want to make sure that I know that I know that I know that I've got Christ at the center of my heart. If that's you, I'm simply going to ask this. Would you just raise your hand and look at me? I'm not going to embarrass you, call you out. You're just saying, that's me. I want to ask that Jesus come into my heart and my life. If that's you, just look at me. I agree with you. My brother, God sees your hand and your heart. Receive that in the name of Jesus, that today that decision's been made. I agree with you that as you raise your hand today, he comes into your heart and your life. There's a lot of frustrations that you have. There's a lot of challenges, and there's a lot of pains, and there's a lot of hurts, but I want you to know God can heal all of those. He just wants you to come before him and be vulnerable before him 
and let him show you. You've had a lot of people telling you what they think and what you should do and what should happen. But he just wants to know, will you come before him and let him show you what he has for you? Because what he has for you is going to give life. Is there any of the hearts here today? Say, Pastor, that's me. I need to make that decision here today. Would you do some more? Okay. Well, Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that, Jesus, you love us so much, you don't want to leave us where we're at, but that you've got something fresh and new for us. So, Lord, I pray today that as we leave here, that old things will become new, and that we'll experiencing, like, experience a refreshing of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everyone said, amen. As we close today, I've asked Lisa if she'd come up. And we just want to pray a special blessing over each family, over each student that's getting prepared for school. So, Lisa, will you just share with us and lead us? You know, here at COSAD, we have a huge heart for the schools in the Gateway area. And we just really want to pray, pray a blessing over the schools, over the families, over our children. Because I don't know how when the last time you walked through one of the schools um, around here are, but it's a little bit different than even the 20-something years ago that I walked those halls as a student. So really, our, our students need your prayer. And we every donut we hand out is prayed over. Every one of those backpacks has been prayed over. But we just really want to pray a special blessing over our children and families today. So Jesus, we thank you that our children are a blessing that comes from you. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to partner with you in raising them and bringing them up into your kingdom. And today, Lord, I just ask that your divine protection would be over each and every school in the Gateway area. Lord, we ask that our hearts would be open, Lord, that our children's hearts would be open to hear and receive from what their teachers have. Lord, I lift each and every teacher in this area up to you. I ask, Lord, that you would give them divine discernment. God, I ask that your peace, your peace that passes all understanding, would be in the midst of each and every classroom, each and every school. Lord, I pray that you would give our administrators discernment. Lord, I pray that you would give um, the government in our community just discernment, Lord, on what our, our community needs and what our schools need. Lord, I ask for each and every student as they walk in, Lord, may their hearts be humble and receptive to the things of you. Lord, may their mouths be filled with honor and wisdom. Lord, I ask that their hands would be tender helping hands to help those in need around them. Lord, I pray that everywhere that their feet would, would trod, that they would be protected. Lord, I ask that your peace would, that passes all understanding would cover them from the first day of school until the last day of school. Lord, we speak your wisdom and your authority into our classrooms over our community. Lord, I just thank you again for the blessing of our children. I thank you for the blessing of this church, Lord, to pour into our schools. And God, I ask that you would continue to reign supreme in our community. Lord, I ask that your presence, your peace, your wisdom would reign in our, in our hearts and in our lives and in our schools this year. And we just thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.